Well, let's turn now to our Bibles and to the book of Psalms, which uh, you'll find in the middle of your Bible, roughly. And uh, it's the closing psalm, Psalm 150. And uh, this will conclude, as I've said earlier, our series on the Psalms. They've been so helpful in many different ways. So uh, if we can have our Bibles open, and then uh, I shall lead us in prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Psalms. We thank you for this great sense of intensity and wholehearted praise that we find at the end of this book. And we ask now as we turn to it and as we read it, as we learn together from it, that we would be like the psalmist who said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. We ask that this may be our praise to you and that this may be offered in the name that is above every name, even the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in Psalm 150, the Bible's songbook. Uh, That's how you could describe the Psalms. And It's interesting as you look at uh, Psalm 1, for example, it begins uh, with teaching us how to live godly lives and how to delight in God's word. Here's what it says. Uh, The psalmist tells us that we're to delight ourselves in the Lord and we are to meditate upon his word day and night. So it begins the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, uh, by telling us that to live life with God in this broken world is that we are to delight in his word, in what he has spoken and revealed to us, in his law, and to meditate on it and live by it. That's how the Psalm book opens in Psalm 1. And in, and, and in between that and Psalm 150, which tells us to delight in praise to God. And in between those two, Psalm 1, Psalm 150, we have almost every emotion, every kind of experience you could possibly uh, conjure up in life. Every trial, every toil, every snare. Every blessing, everything uh, that uh, we can imagine (coughs) when we read the Psalms. And the reality is these two bookends, Psalm 1 and Psalm 150, they help us all the way home to heaven. Because in eternity, this is what we will be doing. We will be praising him continually in heaven. Now as we come uh, to Psalm 150, let me just uh, get you to note and look back, say from from Psalm 146 uh, through to Psalm 150, you have this repeated phrase, phrase, praise the Lord, verse 1 of Psalm 146, and again at the end of verse 10, praise the Lord. The same again in 147, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Uh, Psalm 148, 149, and then 150. So those are the bookends. And these last five Psalms are are rousing us to the praise of God. And the focus of this Psalm, Psalm 150, is about the great deeds and the great glory and honour of God. Uh, It is also not only about what he has done, but who he is. And this morning in this psalm, we're simply going to look at uh, four questions. The why, the where of of praise, the why, the how, and the who. Now it's clear that we're not talking about this kind of mindless attitude that praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord over and over like a repetition. We are to praise the Lord, but we are to also be thinking about why we're doing it and what it is that lies behind it. We are to be thinking well of him, 
because he has revealed his word to us. We are to uh, speak well of God. We are to, uh, as it were, contemplate and consider who he is in his, his great person and in his attributes. And of course, our praise uh, can be expressed through singing, uh, through testifying of God's goodness, uh, through thanksgiving, through praying, through sacrificial service, through sacrificial giving. And while we're not, uh, while we're not presently permitted to sing publicly together, uh, we have that verse in Colossians 3.16 that we're to, make, we're to sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs making melody uh, in our hearts to the Lord. Uh, so uh, we obviously want to get to a point where we can sing. So let's uh, look and uh, work our way through this very brief psalm, but packed with so much. Well, firstly is, where, where are we to praise him? Notice how the psalmist uh, tells us in the sanctuary. He's referring here to the Old Testament people of God, they're gathered in the sanctuary. And notice how the psalm begins. Praise the Lord. So our praise, our thanksgiving is to be brought to the Lord. That is our focus. It's not the music. It's not the preacher. It's not any other things. It is the Lord, the eternal, the eternal God who created us and has uh, worked in our hearts that we enjoy his covenanting love, his commitment to us. That's the reason why we praise him and sing to him. And here the sanctuary relates especially to these corporate gatherings of the Old Testament people of God. It means to praise God uh, in prayer, in preaching, in thanksgiving, all of those things. There is a danger uh, today, of course, where people make the singing and the music only. That is what they call the worship time. And somehow the, uh, the Bible and other parts of it are, are not included in that worship. But that's not the teaching of Scripture. It includes all of those things. And we do this primarily uh, to worship and honour the God who has done great things for us. And we should think about that. That we gather together primarily uh, to meet with God and of course with one another. And we're to offer praise to him. Psalm 100 verse 4 we looked at last week. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So it is through uh, the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, it is through prayers of thanksgiving and intercession uh, and through fellowship together, uh, through celebrating the Lord's Supper, all of those things are included in this call to praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary, verse 1. Praise him in his mighty heavens. In the heavenly places. In other words, the psalmist is telling us we're to praise God everywhere. Yes, we come together corporately. But we're to praise God everywhere. Wherever we are placed. One commentator, Derek Kidner on the Psalms, he says, God's glory fills the universe. His praise must do no less. So it's not that we put on our praise uh, hats, as it were, on a Sunday and we come to the corporate gatherings of God's people. Uh, it, it's, it's all of life and it's everywhere in life. We are to praise God everywhere. And that's what this psalm teaches us. Some of us will know these familiar words. We call them the doxology. We maybe sing them at the end of a, a church service. Uh, and the words are these. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. 
Praise him above, you heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That sums it up. Where are we to praise him? And the answer is simply everywhere and in everything. Secondly, why? Well, the answer to that is in verse 2. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Some versions have praise him for his mighty deeds. Ponder that for a moment as we think of coming together as the people of God. Why are we here? Why are we to praise him? Well, there's many reasons. For the things that he has done. There's, there's an old song that he has done great things. And he has. He formed you while in your mother's womb. He has ordained for us all the days of our lives. We discovered in Psalm 22 that he is the Messiah who was promised to come and to die for our sins. In Psalm 23, we were reminded that he is the God who provides for us, the God who leads us, the God who is our good shepherd. We're reminded that when we sin and falter and fail, Psalm 51 tells us of the forgiveness of God for our sin. God's word then graciously Guides us. He has done great things. <clears throat> Think about it for a moment in your own life. Maybe you can do this when you go home. You can maybe sit down and, and think about how has God dealt with you in the course of your life. Uh, reflect on that. Think about how he chose you in Christ. How he, he went after you. He sought you. He sought your well-being, your salvation. You were dead in your sin. He made you to be born again into a living hope. He's dealt graciously and very patiently with you and I. And then we're reminded and given confidence in Philippians 1.6 that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So why are we to praise him? For all his wonderful works. We're to praise him for his mighty deeds. As, uh, as the Old Testament people did. Uh, you remember that uh, how he uh, delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. The Psalms tell us so much uh, about what God did for his people. He brought them out of slavery he, and out of bondage. And he led them into the promised land. Then later on in their history he brought them out of exile. And so it's worth recounting the deeds of God in our lives. Listen to what we read in Exodus chapter 2, 23 following. Again in the context of the people of God in slavery in Egypt. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of the slavery, of the slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Friends, that is true of you as a child of God. It is worth reflecting on how he 
has delivered you and blessed you. Now, wherever you're from, whatever your background, whatever you're going through right now, whatever you will go through, the greatest deliverance, the greatest deed that God has done is in sending his son as a substitute, as, a, as one who would bear our sins away in his own body, promised from the beginning of time. He has done great things. We should praise him again for his greatness, his surpassing greatness, it says there in verse 2. Apart from his many deeds, apart from what he has done, we are to praise him for who he is. And next term we're going to be looking at who God is. We're going to look very carefully at his character, at some of his attributes. So we are to praise him for what he has done and for who he is. He is the perfect God lacking in nothing. Here's how Paul puts it in 1 Timothy 1, 17. He is the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Again, in 1 Timothy 6 and 16, he is blessed. He is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. And then lastly, here, Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honour and power. Why? For you created all things. And because of your will they exist and were created. Why are we to praise God for his mighty deeds. And for his surpassing greatness. There is no one like him. Uh, a writer from another century or two uh, by the name of William Plummer. He has a gigantic book on the book of Psalms. Uh, and I, I, I don't acknowledge that I've read all of it, but uh, here's a quote from William Plummer. In, uh, and he wrote over a thousand pages uh, on the Psalms. This is what he says. If I could come up with the words that were adequate to, pray, to the praise of God, I would say them. But I can't come up with the words that are adequate, that fully do justice to who he is. It's, it's just beyond us to grasp how wonderful God is. Thirdly, how are we to praise him? Well, I think Psalm 103 is a great example of how we are to praise him. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, you see here in, in verses 3 through to 5, there's a, a catalogue of instruments uh, that touch on various aspects of the corporate life of Israel. There's lots we could say to this. We could go through our Old Testament and, and see these things. But here you have, uh, we're to praise him uh, with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and the lyre, praise him with the tambourine and dancing, and praise him with the strings and flute, Praise him with the clash of the cymbals and praise him with resounding cymbals. Well, some of these instruments were, were used 
to announce things like the year of the Jubilee where freedom would come uh, to many. It's associated with the national life of the people of God. Uh, you have Miriam who, who danced at the great deliverance after the Red Sea. Uh, these, these were used in the praises of God. They were used perhaps in, in just social occasions and in family life, at weddings and other situations. And so it's a reminder that how are we to praise him? We are to praise him with our whole heart and our whole being. We're to praise him with joy. Tim Chester has written a book called Enjoying God. It's a very helpful read. Enjoying God. Do you ever think about it like that? That we're called to enjoy God. Worship is not to be somber and formal and devoid and with, uh, of joy. And yet having said that, we need to be reverent and respectful and thoughtful as we come in uh, to the corporate gatherings for the worship of God. There's to be a, a soberness of mind and attitude. We're coming uh, to confess our sin, uh, uh, to think on the Lord's death and suffering as we gather round the Lord's table. Uh, we're, we're, we're not at a funeral as such, but rather we're there to celebrate the goodness of God. We're there to remember that Christ has died for us. Uh, we are we serve a risen saviour, not a dead saviour, not somebody who's still in the tomb and in the grave, but someone who's alive. And we're not at God's funeral service. We're to come with joyful hearts. We're to come fervently. Uh, the closing song. Today will be 10,000 reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. There's no half-hearted uh, mumbling of the singing. There's no half-hearted attitudes. There's a concentration of mind and of affections and of intellect that enables us uh, to... You see, we don't, we don't come to worship to get ourselves a comfortable seat. We come to be engaged uh, in our minds, to think hard, to, 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 to be conscious of who God is and why we're gathering. It is to shake off our apathy and, and our tiredness in order that we might make praise a priority. So that's how we are to praise him. Now, obviously we, we find that at times when uh, perhaps things aren't going all that well. We don't feel much like praising, praising him. But we have to remember that it is a command. Well, who's to do this praising? Well, it's quite obvious, isn't it? Who is to praise him? Everyone and everything. Everyone and everything. We praise God, you see, not only for what he does, but for who he is and what he is. We offer praise and thanksgiving. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Well, why are we told to do that? Because we were made for that. We were made for God, to know God, to explore who God is. Not, not, not merely to, to rejoice in the, the wonderful things that he has done and the great miracles that he has done, but in who he is. It's about a relationship, and we will see that when we come to look at the character and attributes of God. He's a God who is personal. He's a God who has created us and made us 
for a purpose. And as we said earlier, the Psalms begin with being devoted to delighting in God's word. Listening eagerly. Rather than to the lies of the devil. And we are to be declaring that he is worth living for. That he is worthy of our praise. That in him and in him alone is satisfaction to be found. Is joy. He is to be our greatest treasure. We are to delight in him. There is no one greater. He is what we were made for. We were made for his praise. So we've looked at where we're to praise him, which is everywhere. Why we're to praise him, because of what he's done. And because of who he is. And I say again, you note the fact that God can command his praise. It is a matter of obedience to God. And so, therefore, we need to guard our hearts and focus on him. Uh, seek to be God-centered in our thinking and in our singing and in our praying and in our fellowship and in our responsibilities. Our praise is to be God-centered. And it's a matter of obedience. And, and, and that flows out of, that flows out of deliberately focusing on who God is and what God has done. It demands physically, as it were, uh, deliberately I should say, focusing on him. Our praise of God then is to be God-centered. Praise and worship are part of that. And we are to do that with our whole being, with a sense of joy. We're not together corporately to uh, worship the preacher or the song leader or the musicians or other gifted uh, people. We're here to glorify God. We're here to praise him. Who is our blessed redeemer. Well. As we come to the conclusion of this series in the Psalms. And in Psalm 150. It is telling us that, that we should be caught up. In with the sense of the. Uh, praise and worship of God. And I ask myself this question as I ask you this question. How can we fight our own spiritual apathy and lukewarmness at times? How do we, how do we cultivate uh, our own hearts that help us to focus on God well let me just you know we're all different uh, some are more functional early in the morning others later in the day or in the evening so there's no rules I just want to put a few things out there but I think the hymn writer in, in uh, Christian hymns 689 here's some good advice it says take time to be holy Speak oft, often with the Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him you shall be. Your friends in your conduct. His likeness shall see. And so it goes on. 689 in our hymn book. That's a useful thing to, 
cultivate and stimulate our hearts when we're feeling spiritually apathetic and lukewarm and disinterested. And so we're to think about that. We're to remember Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence. We can be thankful for our salvation. We can be mindful and prayerful. We can start the day perhaps by spending a brief time in the word of God and committing things to prayer. That's one aspect of it. Keeping God at the center of our daily lives with all the rush of it and all that that concerns us. But then we've got to think about how can we better cultivate and prepare our hearts for coming together publicly, you see. Because we're coming together to give praise to God. How can we prepare for that? Well, maybe we can express our thankfulness for the Lord's Day. That the, 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 the discipline and regularity of gathering together and seeing it as a privilege and a responsibility. Again, a brief time in the morning uh, to prepare your hearts, to be mindful that you're, you're going to gather with others. Uh, You're taking part in the praise and worship of God through his word, through prayer, uh, through things that are shared and uh, all kinds of ways. But there needs some preparation for that. For those who are not yet converted, you can be praying for them. You can ask God to help you to worship wholeheartedly and with thankfulness. You you can ask God to grant you uh, the help of his Holy Spirit so that you can understand the teaching of his word and and so that he can reveal his truth to you and so that you can see Christ in the very centre of your worship. And then, how can we better engage with one another after worship, after the public gathering? So we have the private time, We have the corporate time, and then we have the, if you like, the engaging time after the service. Look look for somebody that you can chat with, maybe a newcomer, maybe somebody you haven't caught up with for a bit. All these things are involved when there's a God-centeredness, and when we're concerned for one another, when we're praying for one another. So give thanks to God that as, as you leave church, and you begin a new week or you get together during the growth groups all of these things are meant to give us a God centered focus and a desire to worship him now being human as we are we are prone says another hymn writer we are prone to wonder Lord I feel it prone to leave the God I love We're prone to forget to praise him and to love him. And so all those questions are bound up in this great psalm of praise to God. I wonder for you and for me, how much does praising God characterize my daily life? It's a searching question. An important question. Am I a God-centered person of praise? Am I focused on him as I should be? When I think of who he is and what he's done. Am I a person of praise? Are we a people of praise? Imagine how corporate worship would be richer if each member has been praising God thanking God beginning the day with focusing our thoughts on God looking forward to the weekend when we can gather with the people of God and, and, and rejoice in what he's done for us and, and as our hearts are filled with praise and adoration and joy 
And Sundays should be, if you like, that great uh, uh, intense crescendo uh, of praise to God that would help fuel the fires of our affections and of our, our minds for the week ahead. It should be a time that we look forward to rather than dread. So as we draw to a close, let's think about some of those practical ways how you can further or better cultivate your own heart in secret with God. How we can do that corporately with one another. And, and when the benediction is over, then how do we engage purposefully and prayerfully and thoughtfully with one another? Think about those ways to better cultivate our focus and our priority uh, on God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of Psalms. We thank you for the journey through them together, not all of them, but those that we've looked at. And we pray that you would make us to be a people of praise. For there can be no higher calling than we have than to worship you, the one true and living God. And so we pray, Lord, help us, pardon our sins, and grant us to be God-centered and God-focused in the week that lies ahead. And this we do ask and pray in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.